Live from the Washington, D.C. area, all empowered citizens need to know about intelligent use of resources, smart governance, inclusive communities, smart industry, and healthy, thriving urbanization. This is Smart Sustainability, the TV talk about shaping a sustainable future in the digital age with Nicolette Stividar. The world is built on opposites, even though it's a really tough concept for most of us to understand and live by. Human nature, or I should say the human mind, likes it when ideas and concepts are neatly tucked away in easy to grasp pieces, such as right and wrong, normal and unnormal, loud and silent, rich and poor, blind and sighted, and so on. Humans like to standardize. Our brain likes norms. We somehow associate it with order. That's why we automatically think, most often at least, in terms of win-lose. You're right, I'm wrong, and vice versa is the common thinking. Well, that kind of thinking. That's why we had, and still have, our education divided in special ed for kids in need and others. But what happens when we include opposites, break through this conventional thinking that keeps us trapped in an either-or way of looking at things? What's on the other side? Pure creative brilliance? When we bring opposites together, can we even reach new creative heights? Is that the secret? Our topic tonight, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nicolette de Vidar. Everyone talks about inclusion, yet it's so hard in practice. We see it every day in government, how decisions are made, in businesses when they talk about inclusion, but really want the other party behave more like they do. The word fit comes to mind. You're not a fit, ever heard that? Most people have, and it's anything but inclusive. Reality is, true inclusion doesn't happen as long as our hearts are not fully developed to rise above. True inclusion means I respect you the way you are and don't want you to be any different because you're perfect just the way you are. True inclusion means let's share our minds and vision and have an open mind for what's emerging. How that can work and what amazing creative brilliance we can actually get to and co-create together once we get to the other side is what we'll show you tonight. Joining us from Liverpool is an amazingly talented group of people who practice reverse inclusion day to day and the outcome is simply stunning. St. Vincent is a specialty school for sensory impairment and other needs here in Liverpool in the UK and make unique collaborations between the blind and the sighted, the deaf and the hearing and really rise above. What you'll see will speak to itself. Talk about brilliance from another realm. So please meet Dr. John Patterson. He's the mastermind of reverse inclusion. Well, I call him that. Ian Rasmussen, who helps put these amazing projects together. We had another student, Joe Critchlow, who can't be here tonight. We have Anthony Madden, a student and participant of the Journey for Peace. And we have also Angela Williams join us. She's a member of Inner Wheel and Rotary UK an ambassador for Sightbox Trust and has also direct experience with Sightbox teachings for the blind and visually impaired in Nepal, Senegal, Tanzania and Gambia. Welcome all of you. Give you a warm wave across the pond, so to speak. Great a to have you on. A very big warm wave back. <laughs> a very big warm wave back. That's good. And just for actually our audience, you know, there is a time difference of five hours, so it's really late over there. And um, we have Anthony, but we'll make it quick to get you sort of to bed before midnight in the UK, I hope, but we'll see. So let's start. Let me ask, actually, I'm going to start with Anthony. How do you feel being with us tonight? Honest, really. Um, <laughs> you know, first made a few school, you don't really get the chance to do this. So, yes, yeah, it's just an honor, really. So you're not too tired, you're still awake, sort of? I've had my nap, so you know, I'm prepared for this. <laughs> We've all got our pajamas on underneath these shirts, you know. <laughs> yes. Let's talk about the reverse inclusion, actually. I want to start with that. John, can you explain to us what that is? 
Reverse inclusion, it's very, very powerful when you include children with disabilities with children without disabilities. In our case, visually impaired and hearing impaired. But the point is, visually impaired young people lead sighted children in the mm -hmm. things they are incredibly strong at. All children have strengths. Mm -hmm. Our visually impaired children have amazing creativity strengths. Mm -hmm. So they lead children from other schools in activities and projects. The children in our school will have strengths in key areas, music, art, dance, drama, sport, tons of ICT that we can demonstrate, tons of ICT, enormous amounts of horticultural work. And the children lead sighted children. What it does is breaks down barriers. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, it encourages our children's creativity and their confidence. And we can show you case after case of young people like Anthony, who've shared their strengths with other people, their confidence has risen, and their creative innovation goes through the roof. That's what Sightbox actually comes from. Now, you talked about reverse inclusion, visually impaired children lead the, 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 the sighted children. Explain to us a little bit what exactly that entails, because I think most people, at least here in the US, they are... Um, Certainly in the know that we have inclusive classrooms, but we, what we, what we don't really, I mean, this, this idea that they lead, that's a different story. So explain to us a little bit what that, what that means and what that could look like. Okay, well, if I start from, I'll start from a simple point and then we'll build on that picture and I'll use some examples if I may. We'll start with sports. Mm -hmm. One of our young men, Rainbow, he's actually in, he's in Germany at the minute, playing football for England, and he plays for the, the England VI, visually impaired squad. Uh, but with the support all the way from primary and his teachers, he's been training other people in sports. So he's taught sighted children goalball, Raphael. he's taught sighted children botcher, he's taught sighted children uh, that have come to the schools, but we build that. He's then taught university students and he's taught uh, young people at Manchester United Football Club. Bear with me. He is teaching other children with disabilities as a totally blind young man how to play football. That is reverse inclusion. The end outcome is a young man who's really shown what his strengths are and it gives you roots to employment. Let me share another idea. One of our young girls was showing um, reverse inclusion within technology. Beth. She actually worked with Kellogg's and they've got an app <laughs> with Kellogg's because she sees things differently. Within reverse inclusion, the technology she was working with, she was leading on the innovation. Idea and outcome, routes to employability, working with Kellogg's. Similar group were actually working with, uh, I think called Orcam, very clever piece of equipment on, on, on your glasses. But the point being, our young people's strengths are really nurtured. That's reverse inclusion. Anthony's reverse inclusion is showing people journalism, is showing people how to engage with art, what he wants to see in the comics that he's been developing, uh, mm -hmm. like JPs, not like the magic bench. Mm -hmm. So reverse inclusion is putting people on a level playing field, breaking down barriers to people's perceptions of visual impairment. But it's clearly linked to roots to employability. In the UK, it's 85% of young people with a visual impairment struggle to find work. Uh, I don't think it's so dissimilar in America. It's certainly a lot worse in the countries that we're working with mm -hmm. in Sightbox. But reverse inclusion, I can also from the horticulture, uh, Mr. Swanston, I'd like to highlight Mr. Swanston here in horticulture and Sightbox, I'd mm -hmm. like to come up to that game later on. But he's training young people uh, with the staff in horticulture who have been leading others, like the RHS, the Royal Horticultural Society, Tap and Show, where this is one of the biggest gardening events um, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And our children were there showing people how they grew vegetables, how they grew fruit, how they made those vegetables into soup and gift and look how they made apple crumble for the homeless. 
yeah. very powerful medium connecting our pupils space. So John, does this all come from the children's imagination? What, what, the, the, there's a step here, reverse inclusion. Children's strengths is number one, and you put those strengths into projects like Journey for Peace, like Reclaim the Green, Reclaim mm -hmm. the Nation. Then you involve reverse inclusion. So our children's confidence really, really, really rises. And it's at that point you ask the children, what would you design? What would you make? You ask the pupil voice. And that's when you see the real imagination and the creative imagination of our people kick in. Ian? Uh, may I, may I uh, chip in here? Uh, what it starts out as is uh, a pedagogic method of um, including young VI people their own education and in the education of others. And it mm -hmm. does create one of the set, which is great confidence in that student, but then it goes on to create an improved imagination of the partner for the visually and uh, uh, the non visually impaired student actually is able to see visually impaired students in competent functioning roles. Mm -hmm. So it, it creates a binary effect. And you mentioned uh, op op opposite control, the binary opposite. We don't really believe in binary oppositions in education. There are classifications of students. And VI uh, students don't enjoy very good representation. And that lack of visibility in representation across all areas, race, gender, uh, uh, disability, that, that, that disables employees mm. from being able to imagine VI students in certain roles. And actually, the only thing that inhibits VI students, what I mean this, Hold that thought for a moment, Ian, because yeah. I think I can hear some background noise and I'm not sure if this is the internet connection over there or if this is coming else. So I'm going to shift to Angela here for a second and then go back to you. Um, Angela, when you were working with, how did you get in contact with St. Vincent to begin with? How did you hear about the whole thing? I was introduced to uh, St. Vincent School um, through my charities um, and my organizations, Inwheel and Rotary. Um, and I just loved the work that the children were doing. I got invited to go back and um, teach them with the environment, the green, and that's how they came up with a, a greenhouse made out of plastic bottles. And from there, I just wanted to, to share the ideas and I just got involved with them and just enjoyed being with the children. And we came up with the idea of having the items of sport, balls with bells in them, to go into a box and just share those and ideas around the world with other children just like themselves to be included in education within society rather than being left on their own mm -hmm. so anthony let me ask you when you did the the journal when you worked on reverse inclusion for journalism so how do you go about this do you kind of say this is what i kind of like to envision for comments or how how do you how do you work with that uh, well, I just like to see it as my own little hobby, really. Uh, okay. I don't really count it as a, a means to change my future. Like, it is always a step in life that I can always take. But there's, well, I'm, I'm just loving journaling, really, so. Yeah. So I'm seeing here on the back in the studio one of the comments we actually had from John Lennon, which now is gone. Um, can we put this back up? Here we go. Peace is not something you wish for, it's something you make, something you do, something you are, and something you give away. So with quotes like this, who does then the art direction for those absolutely stunning graphics and pictures and put them together. Shall I start that and you, you feed in on that? Sure. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. You you get that the Journey for Peace was mm -hmm. an essay written by Joe Critchlow and it was a message is that the Liverpool statues, key statues, iconic statues in Liverpool gave him in his story about love and justice and hope and peace and friendship. 
key messages given by statues like the Liver Birds, John Lennon, and the War Memorial. Those key messages in his essay, he read actually in uh, New York, UN Day there with an essay competition for the Lions. He won and read that in Braille uh, in, the, in America there. He came back and said, right, what are we gonna do? And we sat down with our journalist group, which Anthony is a member. How are we gonna share this message, these messages globally? We decided to put them in the comics. Children decided, let's put them in comics. Mm -hmm. We were fortunate because we found an artist called Laura Birds. She's called Evie Fox as an artist. And she translated that story, working with the children, into seven themed comics. They are all on the internet and we can share them with you. There's the John Lennon one. Yeah, and we actually have, we have the journey of peace, which we can actually show if we can put it up. We do have the graphics, but you can also, of course, show it in the camera if you have it already. There's a whole cartoon series of it, right? And the Journey of Peace then was also put into a musical. Yeah, well, it, it, it gets really interesting from there. So we had a wonderful artist who made them into comics. And would you believe Yoko Ono actually picked up on our project yeah. and tweeted it, you know, obviously with the Liverpool links. <laughs> During the pandemic, we gifted those comics to schools to use in Liverpool. We didn't stop there because the children wanted cross-curricular wear. Because don't forget our children have strengths in key areas of music and art and dance. So the children decided on a musical. And our children reached out to the schools around the world where the site box is. Pakistan, India, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Indonesia, Nepal. And we asked children, visually impaired young people, to write songs about those key messages love justice hope and peace and in liverpool we pulled it all together a place called the fashion hub which is a wonderful place gary miller uh, steve mcfarland and peter oliver redesign x and we had a global peace and love and justice musical all of the music generated by visually impaired young people that's a powerful way of all of our children in different creative strengths pulling a global message together, reaching yeah. out to those countries where the psych box is. Now, Anthony was a big part of that, because obviously the comics, you have to read the full comic, because the, what that comic looks like and the messages in it were all developed by that, like a group called Shenanigans. We call it Shenanigans. <laughs> they do creative writing. We get up to lots of shenanigans in Shenanigans, and an outcome of that was a comic, a very visual medium, but a visual medium shared by visually impaired new people around the world. Yeah, I've, I've seen the comics and I will say they are absolutely stunning, 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 stunning. That's all I can say. And I really, I would actually, I think you have most of them also on the St. Vincent website, right? So I would yeah. invite our viewers also to go and check it out. We'll show you the web, um, uh, the, the web page where you can go and actually see a little bit more of them. It's, it's just, it's, it's really absolutely amazing. Now, let me ask you something. And Ian, I'm, I'm, this question goes to you since I cut you short before with the audio here. So, this, this, this whole concept seems to me it's really backwards from what most of our education outlook generally is. So, and that's what I meant, that is maybe that's a little bit the, is that a little bit of the rebel spirit of Liverpool that kind of comes through there? Or how do you, how did you, how did this whole idea come up and then how do you match kids for creative projects? Well, <clears throat> Liverpool does like to look, look at things differently. Uh, I remember there used to be a sign on the end of the motorway to approach Liverpool, which had changed priorities ahead. Which was <laughs> very apt to the, the mindset of the city. Um, yes, it might have something to do. It's a very creative city. You know, it, it, equals, um, it, it produces way more writers and musicians and creative people than its population size would really suggest. Uh, and especially in the areas of sports as well, because it's a very fine football club. Um, but yes, it, it, Liverpool is a very gritty, creative place for Liverpool. You look things through different um, lens to the rest of the world quite often. And you know, we've gone through a kind of very traumatic period with the pandemic. 
And during times like that, people look for different approaches. Trauma can lead to um, a need to be back together, uh, mm -hmm. to be back into a community, to rejoin things, to be to have a sense of connectedness. And that's what we do. That's our starting point. We, we start off with the idea that we want to connect with the world. Liverpool, by the way, has always been connected with the world. Uh, uh, way back uh, in, in trade, uh, in, 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 in connection with the British Empire, etc. But um, we, we like being at uh, the centre of the conversation in Liverpool, and we, we, we're not uh, we're not back in coming forward, putting forward our ideas, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what we're doing. Uh, we, we create these ideas, which work. We think we have the best curriculum in the world, provisionally we can. And we've developed that into sort of creative projects, which we then try to get people to take on board. We're giving these as gifts, we're not trying to mm -hmm. exploit financial gain. The idea of the journey to peace has been translated into an American context because we want our cousins in America to enjoy the benefits of what that can create as well. Mm -hmm. and, and it creates a virtuous cycle because. Once we start speaking to people in other countries and swapping ideas, we are creating a real global community um, through our educational projects, which do lead to peace. People who talk together don't, don't fight together. Mm -hmm. Ab absolutely. So, Anthony, on the journey for peace, how long were you working on that project? Did it take months? Did it take... How long were you working on this? It was like... I'd say eight months, wasn't it? So eight months. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it, it was, of course, like hard trying to make your video cook ideas. And you also got to go to school. So, um, really, it was just a challenge making it, but in the end, it was great results, really. So, how, how did this make you feel? when you see at the end of the process, when it's all coming together and you actually heard it for the first time, what was, do you remember how you felt? I felt like I actually achieved something in life. Not, not just one little thing, it was more, this is a stepping stone that you're gonna take, which I love stepping stones. Mm -hmm. so. And how was the atmosphere like? How was the working culture of all the different people that participated on that project? Were you like, were you all excited when you got together? Was this like a regular working group? Talk to us a little bit about your experience, what it was like. It was nerve wracking because, you know, you got to come up with thoughts, but um, everyone just had the enthusiasm of what they want to come up with. We chose it into the story. We, like, like, uh, as and as just said, hmm. all came together. And as as I've just said, like, was, we want a community. Yeah. yeah. Was was there a point in it where you were perhaps afraid at some point that maybe your vision or the idea that you had kind of envisioned in your mind was perhaps there was a danger of not having this properly executed like you know in in then as it come together or was there a point when you said that's what i was envisioning and i'm just open to see whatever comes out of it of course i was afraid that it wasn't going to go properly but i also knew that that we have in shenanigans mm -hmm. our, our kids so they're gonna of course, come with some great ideas like comics, mm -hmm. and yeah. So, were uh, there some key lessons for you that you learned on the project? What did you take away from it? Just pretty much keep going. Um, you're uh, like trying to develop your mind to not just think of ideas, but also put them down. Really and be fan of your ideas. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Angela, now we talked a lot about the site box. Let's talk about the site box. Let's talk about how do we actually envision the site box and what's in it? Well, the site box is a big blue box. Um, it's a magic box with no bottom. Um, it's full of ideas um, which we share 
There are handballs with bells in. There's a game of boccia with a grid for the playing area because obviously if you're blind or vision impaired, you cannot see the playing area. So we have the grid with raised squares. And there's parachute canopy, there are running tethers, there's a talking pedometer and a talking watch so they can time and the games that they're playing, etc. cetera. Um, Botcher is really a maths and a science lesson and uh, it gets people having the fun, the inclusion coming together. Um, but they calculate their spaces, paces and uh, they're pegged onto the board. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just incredible that simple items of sport can bring so much Mm -hmm. excitement and enjoyment to these children. Yeah, so there are actual physical objects in the site box. Yes, yeah. So then you take them out, you go there. Now you've also used that to teach in some, some countries yourself. What was your experience? And let me qualify, are you actually a trained teacher? Is it necessary to be a trained teacher? No, I'm not a qualified teacher at all. Um, I just teach from the heart. I just love what I'm doing with these children to see them smile and be happy um, and not be sat in a corner doing nothing. So just to, to, to go to a country and work with some of these children is so, so rewarding. It, it's lovely. It really is. Mm -hmm. can, so can you describe, can you share a moment when you had like this real, a, a real touchy moment when you went to one of the countries, maybe Gambia or, or Tanzania, yeah. wherever you went to, and you kind of tried this out the first time and you experienced how that learning would kind of come across to the kids? Yeah. Um, in the Gambia, um, I went out in November 2019 and I was living out there for six months. I wanted the children to come up with their own ideas of the games, but I was working with them and the blind teachers because at the school I was at, there was only two sighted teachers. So that was hard for me to experience as well. But we got through it. There was not a barrier really for me. I just had the courage to go forward. And we had all the children and the teachers from the November to the January learning the games. And then from the January, it was so rewarding for me to see that the lessons I'd been teaching had really sunk into those teachers and the children. And I would just watch the teachers just take over. That for me was so, so rewarding. And then they came up with their own idea of a simple game of baseball. No, no bat involved, but they went round the, the posts together. Um, supporting each other. The posts were people holding balls with the bells in or banging spoons or just making a noise and they would just go to these posts. But it was just so nice to see the inclusion of everybody mm. um, and the impact that it had really. Because mm. um, I had actually taken the first box to the Gambia back in 2018. And to go back again in the November 19 and spend the time with the children, their mass results in that short time of having that first box to me going back had gone from a 35% pass rate to a 95% pass rate. Massive, massive achievement for those children. And it just shows you the outcomes. It's soft to hard learning the outcomes from the contents of the box, working with these children and the teachers. And they are now becoming the trainers themselves. So which is absolutely brilliant. It really is. Yeah. John, who came up with the name of the site box? There's a story there. We, we, we went to the then Lord Mayor of Liverpool, Gary Miller, and a wonderful guy, and he'd come into our school to really, really interested in inclusion. Yeah. So we've got all of these ideas, and uh, we want to put them around the world. We're going to put them in the box, and he goes, well, let us site box. And we went, you know what? Well, it's brilliant. We're going, to, we're going to call it site box. The site box itself, what's wonderful about it, the content, the teaching and learning around that, there's a lot of teaching and learning that surrounds the use of that equipment. And we know disabilities, pan disability, pan disabilities, visually impaired are the lowest participatory group of all. And that's in our wealthy countries. That's in our wealthy countries. You can only imagine what it's like in the Gambia and other countries where they don't have access to education. Yeah. So it's worth noting, you know, our vice principal, Dave Swanston, has written an awful lot of content that Angela's using, how you use that equipment. Mm. Uh, the ideas that are coming from that, 
include iRugby, brand new, nothing like it in the world, developed an iRugby ball. Now, for that work, for generating that teaching and learning around Sidebox, uh, he's won the UK award, it's a Pearson's award, which is it's like that's the Oscars of education. And if you're looking on the internet now, he's been shortlisted for that Barkey Foundation Global Teacher Prize. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the teaching and learning that comes out of a specialist school here is the best in the world. And, and we want to share it. It's our children who share it themselves. Mm-hmm. They are the teachers and learners of it. We're actually remotely training children in Malawi from our children out in Tanzania how to use the content of that box. It's a powerful medium and it's a catalyst for change and it's a catalyst for inclusion. When you see some of the film footage, it's yeah. on our school website and its impact is incredible. Yeah, see, a lot of these concepts are really very much fast forward already, very progressive in how you look at this. Um, you, you, you basically, you combine a lot of those concepts that in many countries, I think, and in also in a lot of schools are still kind of in separate corners. People know they would have to integrate it, but there still, I think, is kind of a, a hurdle on that. And when, when you look at these type of works, they're so amazing that I think one can really, the natural question is what took us so long to actually do it and, and go past this and look at a different approach in how you, we, we can make this happen. What do you think, John, was the original thing or what still is maybe the big holdup today? I think people have focused too much on attainment rather than achievement. So we've been focused into exams, focused into funneling our children into mm. these jobs that no longer exist. Mm. You know, the late great Sir Ken Robinson talked a lot about that. It's all about exams. No, it shouldn't be. It should be about finding achievements, what children are particularly powerful at, and following them in that, encouraging them in that. We, we do a lot with the Duke of Edinburgh Award. Um, I don't think you've heard of that. The Duke of Edinburgh Award is an alternative qualification for men. It's like mm-hmm. Royal Highness Prince Philip. And it's, uh, it, it encourages children to get out there into the environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, very good awards. We've got children here who are gold uh, Duke of Edinburgh Award. So what we need to do is link vocational strategies, link achievements, and link achievements and vocational strategies with individual teaching and learning that really focuses children's strengths. The site box, loads of the content that, loads of the ideas from the children themselves. Yeah. It's nurturing those children's voices and what they want to do. That's what's key in individual teaching and learning. Yeah, because we- I, I, I find even the idea of the students being the teacher and the student, you know, simultaneously. I can see, I actually would consider this still, yes, this is the gold standard of education, but I think in many cases today, this is kind of still quite a rebellious idea. Just think about, you know, you see in most schools, if, if you tell um, most, a lot of teachers, I think originally, if they hear, well, the student is actually the student and the teacher, that's a very philosophically advanced concept and to really get used to this idea i mean this 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 takes a little bit of of work wouldn't you say so i would say yes so what we have done is we purposely shared those ideas journey for peace as a project have a look at it change it for your children co-create that which is obviously what we're looking at your lovely selves on it's a framework that can be adapted because Liverpool, you know, it's very distinct there. It's Liverpool, Sefton, there's Knowsley, there's Norris Green. It's all different. So you change it for those communities. Hence, the journey for peace can be adapted in America for different communities. The reclaim the green, reclaim the nature, the horticultural work. Again, it's a framework. The OECD, the World Bank, have looked for years for a formula to reconcile social cohesion with economic success. They look for years for it. What we reckon we've got is a is a formula here in St. Vincent's. The formula is very simple. Creativity. Engage children in creativity. Engage children in reverse inclusion. 
to lift their, their, their confidence and their abilities. Engage volunteerism, service learning. So we bring in university students that volunteer to work with us. What you get are significant outcomes. Those outcomes are those routes to employment so that children do not become meat, not in education, employment and training. And their ideas are taken forward. America is is ahead of the game. You, you're a great place for ideas to be picked up and take, taken into business. I think we're a little slower here in the UK for that. So in a way, there's a wonderful way where the, the energy of America, you know, that at, go for it, can be linked with the type of curriculum that we're sharing with you online around the world mm -hmm. the site box. Yep, and we actually, for our viewers, I do want to let our viewers know also that we are planning a project together with St. Vincent to actually reach out across the country to schools and to kids and get them involved in a huge project to work together and kind of, you know, really push this collaboration a step forward. I want to talk a little bit more about the site box because I'm not so sure it's quite clear yet. So we know what's in the site box, roughly. We know it's a blue box. Let's talk a little bit more about what that actually looks like. So the box gets then shipped to schools. Is there always the same content in the box, Angela? Yes. Every school that the box goes to um, is exactly the same. Um, same contents with all the lesson plans in there as well, um, in the language of where the school has gone to for the country. Um, so every country receives a box for a school. The box doesn't just work with 10 children, it can work with 35, 40, 50 children. It covers everybody so that you know that it's all the same content. So is that a fixed curriculum in there or can that be adapted? It can be adapted, adapted to suit the needs of the children where, wherever it's gone. Yeah. It's, we have a, obviously a set package to begin with, um, but we, we, we adapt from there as well. So there's, mm -hmm. there's no issues there. No. Mm -hmm. And the side box, that's also where the Rotary or the Rotarians get involved significantly, right? Because I believe you use this for fundraising, so Rotarians do support the side box developments that then get shipped to schools? What I've actually done is where I've been um, in countries, um, I've come back and I've been given presentations to inner wheel clubs, Rotary clubs, and it's them that have been funding, thanking me for the work that I'm doing through St. Vincent School, and that money is then allowing more boxes to go to different countries so uh, it's through my presentations that the, the money is coming in but we, we want to go out differently now we're asking for the comics with the journey for peace the expansion of the whole curriculum um, with the site box and mm. St Vincent's in, into the schools in a much bigger way now. Mm. So Anthony what would be your message for American kids for example to participate in a project together do you have do you have something you want to share? keep going, you know, uh, life can be tough. Some parts that you've been picking out to be a in disguise and you've got to take that on and you just got to <laughs> go forward with it and try and make it your vision. Is there, is there something specific you would look for in, in terms of a particular project that you would want kids to get involved with? Is it the environment? Is it, is, it, is it the journey for peace? Is it something else? Um, well, recently, um, the Magic Bench that have been out, I would probably work on that with kids. Uh, we probably need to explain the magic bench a little bit. Yeah, but I was going to just... say we have to explain the magic bench. Can we go back a little for a little second? We're all seeing it from our from our country's eyes. You know, a box with sports equipment in. Yeah. What you will not have seen, what what that lands in a school for the visually impaired somewhere in the world, like Ethiopia, like Malawi, it is game changing because the children are not included in the communities. They're suddenly included in sports and they can play together. This is unbelievable. This is like what must have happened when the first computer went in somebody and they could see somebody around the world. It is really impactful. Those children 
let's say in Ethiopia, let's say Malawi, I've not been used to that. Particularly the girls, they then are asked as part of the curriculum of the site box, what would you design? Some incredible stuff came back from girls in Kenya, some fantastic stuff from children in Indonesia. The children themselves, because they've been given access to sports as a game changer, you have to understand the power of sports in its own right. They then are designing new ideas for site box. That's where Angela said at the beginning, it's a box with a magic no button. We keep adding new content to it. So at the moment, Mr. Swanson's developing iRugby, very clever piece of kit. We want to send that out into the site box. Other countries will be included in the content that goes in it. Mm. We all create it. We all own it. Our children in the UK are using remote means to teach children how to use the content. So we're growing how we use technology to share teaching and learning for visually impaired. There's some stunning films of, of what's happened when that's landed in countries. Yeah. We move on to the Magic Bench show. So that's quite cool. So you basically, though, just just to summarize this also for, for our viewers, so you talk about a lot about all these really hot button topics, so to speak. So we have the environment, which is covered by the Magic Bench, and we'll explain that in a little bit. We have... Um, technology which is another one that you kind of try to integrate we have sports so so we have uh, writing we have arts we have music so all these areas are basically covered did I forget yes. anything oh and no. not to forget there's one other one that I wanted to bring Ian back on actually so there's also the cooperation between the kids basically with um, companies, I believe, right? So they tap yeah. into this imagination and the creativity of those children to work on specific research projects. Is that correct, Ian? Yes. Uh, the, the visually impaired students have a, a limitless imagination and can see the world from a very different angle. And uh, don't make assumptions about what other people can do and can't do. And they look for sort of creative solutions. Mm -hmm. So but do I, they I, then I, reach out to St. Vincent and then you kind of give this to your students and say, let's come up with a solution? Or do, how does this work? Yeah, both ways. Both ways? St. So Vincent's asked for an input or the students here for ideas. We'd like to know which Kellogg's product is on the shelf for the looking for it. So right. How are we going to go about that? Or we will live in a technological age. What approach that from an app point of view, or how's that going to work, etc. But I'd like to go a little bit further back to the idea about reverse inclusion because you mentioned you registered some surprise about students being simultaneously the, the learners and the teacher. That idea of peer to peer uh, learning is not a new concept, but it has assumed a, a kind of homogeneity about the, the, the cohort that people are on similar sort of levels and they, they can learn on that basis. When you uh, add the word inclusion to that, uh, you're taking usually VI students out of their world and into a sighted world, which is an asymmetrical context, where you're assuming that the sighted people can aid the VI people. Well, what we've done is a reverse of that. We've put sighted people into the VI context. But even that's now evolved, because we're now doing double reverse inclusion. We're collaborating with the school whose students have a complex needs. Mm -hmm. So that our students and their students are then teaching each other and learning together. And the idea can morph endlessly in that way. Hmm. So, so that sounds to me really what I initially said a little bit at the beginning or at the intro, that you manage to bring those opposites in a way together and really break through. Did yes. I get that right? Yes. Yes. We, we get rid of the whole idea about binary oppositions. And we really, we, when we bring students to we call it the person who, it really does level the playing field, but it, it has it has symmetrically beneficial outcomes, but they're different for each side of the group. Mm -hmm. So for the guy students, they get confidence, they get training, um, and they also get uh, the opportunity to do things that often in mainstream schooling, they're limited. There are students here who've been brought from different parts of the country because they weren't really, schools might talk about being inclusive, 
but really cannot be properly tutored in their mm. facilities of our students. That's mm. why it's even smaller in the country, and I'm around the world from here. Yeah. So when we look at all these fantastic cartoons and we look at all these great outcomes, it looks very clean and easy. But we haven't talked about the collaboration itself yet, which I'm not so sure it's so clean and easy. Let's talk about some of the, of the main things that need to be addressed. Let's start with, since you started with the inclusion or the, re the reverse inclusion to now, what were some of the key learning points that you say I see today differently than I saw a year ago? Okay, key, key things that we see differently. Um, there is a lot of talk of collaborations, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, 17 yep. goals to save the planet. And actually, it's very difficult to get proper collaborations. Uh, you, you, you often have to give away awful lots of the ideas to actually get people to be included and sometimes that doesn't work we, we need a very very open discussion where people help each other a lot more that's one of the reasons of the journey for peace but but perhaps we could answer that question through the magic bench because that's actually what we did with the magic bench we were asking rotary to support us with the site box we're asking the lions who've also supported us with the site box. Read these comics, give them into your schools. And I don't know if we're clear what, 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 what um, I don't think they're clear on what we're doing. Not all of them anyway. What we're saying is, here's a comic. Take it into a school. Ask children to raise one pence or one cents and match funding. Just like they do with their polio with the Bill Gates Foundation. We're doing the same type of process but you have to spend an awful lot of time explaining to each individual person, this is what we're doing, to get some action, even though we've got it all online. People are so pounded with, it, with information, it, it, it's difficult to share that in a way that people will get active. So what we did was the Magic Bench. Mm -hmm. Our partners for the Magic Bench, it's actually Merseyside Police, because uh, we want lots of opportunities. Our chief constable's wonderful. Serena Kennedy just really put a big focus on inclusion. Working with their creative, creative classrooms, we do the fantastic animation. Obviously, our children's story writing. We're working with Let's Go Zero and Basic Region. It's the same as Schools Network, which we've set up as part of the UK Sustainable Schools Network. Yeah. Our idea in the Magic Bench. Well, let's, let's, recap, let, let's talk here for a second about the magic bench so it really comes yeah. across what, what the idea and the concept of the magic bench is. Okay, do you want me to jump in there? Hey, yeah, because um, magic bench, please do. The, the magic bench is actually a physical, but it's also a metaphor. Yes. For, uh, for, uh, uh, let me recapture a phrase from the 1970s. I have to remember that. Um, uh, think globally and act locally. So what we produce is a magic bench. So the idea that you sit on the bench and the bench enables you to listen to nature mm -hmm. where you are and, and respond to those local needs with appropriate actions. It might be on a very small scale, but if we all do a very small amount and everyone does a very small amount, it adds up to a very large amount of effect. That's what it is, both a metaphor, but also a physical thing to individualize our concept wherever it happens to go around the world. So when I go in the park and I sit on a bench and then I listen to nature and I think of tons of stories, actually, I can tell you yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then I think about all these things, you know, what's the other meaning of, of certain what's birds and certain park? plants and things like that. I would capture that in a story. Yeah, in a story. Yeah. And what's going on in your park is not what's going on in my park. Yeah. But they might they might share common global issues. Yeah. It's yeah, like so for what? example, when I go to the bench, for example, I'm always getting really upset about all the plastic bottles that lay around because people yeah. fail to pick them up, and I find them very disturbing for nature, for example. Yeah. So I think that's Absolutely. a fairly common topic in other stories as well. Yeah, you will. That's the magic bench. Is the story of our local park, Springfield Park. It's a real park. And uh, the children's, has a children's hospital. It has a children's hospital in it, Alder Hay Hospital. It has the leading ophthalmologists in it. So it's, it's a very 
relevant local story. Mm -hmm. That's what we're saying about Journey of the Peace, adapted. And in our, in our, in our story, um, Anthony was our key character. And Anthony in the story was going through the park with his, his uh, stick. And he came across a bench that hadn't been there before, but it was created by a tree. And, and when he sat on it, you could speak to the animals. And the animals said, the problem is there aren't kids here anymore. And why is that? And Anthony says, well, they're all in their bedrooms on their phones. And Mother Nature wants the children back because the children are not related and interacting with the environment. They forget it and they devalue it. So when the children were brought back by Anthony really saying well, it's a competition, it's a big prize, and, <laughs> and the kid that goes around on social media and all the kids arrive expecting some great prize, and eventually he's asked, well, what, who's won? And he says, everyone, because the, the, the park is being played in again, kids are isolated in their bedroom, being miserable, mm -hmm. uh, having fun in the sunshine and getting healthy, and re-engaging with the environment. And that can be a theme that could be taken anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. so, so at the end of the musical, Nicola, the Jerry Peace musical, the C. Biggio said, we do our little bit to change the world, just a little bit. It was a beautiful mm -hmm. thing that Miggio sent in. It's the same thing. What are our children doing with their stories for climate action? Mm -hmm. And you know what? We're inviting people to write their stories. But you know, it gets better. With the UK Sustainable Schools and Let's Go Zero, we're actually in COP26. We're going to Edinburgh for COP26, where world leaders are. We're going to be handing out our Magic Bench story and inviting participation alongside a small packet of seeds, wildflower seeds, our children grew in the grounds of seeds. So we're taking our story of climate action all the way to COP26. That's quite significant. If we all do a little bit for nature. One of our young men said it. I'm doing for the bit for nature that I may never see. What are you doing? All back to that reverse inclusion, mm -hmm. our children's ideas uh, and creative abilities being included yeah. in that. Yeah. You know what, one thing, the way that the Magic Bench is working, the spin-offs from that are the incredible ideas our children are actually having for climate action that we're, we're making in school, carbon capture units and everything. If you go on, reclaim the green, reclaim the nature. That's the spin-off innovation that comes from creative writing. It's amazing once you start getting creative where that spins. Let's go zero. Let's go zero. Let's go zero is a great group. It's all about uh, getting carbon right down. Uh, 23rd. And, we're, and we're, we're, we're leading on the ideas for it. Harriet Lamp. Yeah. Well, let's go zero. So we're very encouraged that we've got some you know, real shakers and rattlers, real movers for climate action. They're coming and saying, okay, give us some ideas. That's beautiful, because the yeah. ideas are our young people's. Very encouraging. Yes, that is. So we have about four minutes left. Anthony, I want to ask you, from the Magic Bench, what what are you hoping to, what, what comes out of this? What are you hoping to achieve? Um, I'm just hoping to really take on more projects and get involved with a lot more things. Um, like, like I said at the beginning, um, normal schools wouldn't allow this and that. With, that's with like the inclusion kind of thing. And even this small little story that we're talking about now has changed a big part in me. And I just can't wait to take on more projects, really. Mm -hmm. So, Angela, I know we're jumping back and forth here all the time, but I do, I do want to go back to the site box because I don't know if you are actually also involved in the magic bench or not. I think mainly in the site box, right? Just the site box, yes, at yeah. the moment. So, mm -hmm. so, so let, let's talk a little bit about what would you say, what, what are some of the key messages you would give on to audiences, to teachers who would use the site box, for example, and also for, for people just to learn more about that? What would you say to them about the importance of trying it out? Just give it a go. Um, <laughs> don't, be, don't be afraid. Um, there are so many ideas. It, it's just the enjoyment, the happiness, the inclusion, um, to see where the countries, where the boxes have gone, 
where the children had nothing and now they've got something. It's like a piece of gold for them. Um, and the outcomes that are, co that are coming from them, their in improvement in their confidence, their independence, it's so much to see and can be developed and, and blossom from that. But it's just to come back with their own ideas as well to then develop it even further. Mm. Can we summarize just briefly for our audience again what's in the site box? Because I'm kind of really by now, after all this talk about this, I imagine this is a site box. There's all these different things in there. Can we totally kind of summarize though and, and say that's all in there? Glasses, curriculum, what else? We have handballs with bells in. There's a game of boccia with the, the playing grid. There's a parachute canopy, running tethers. Um, to guide people running and there's a, a talking pedometer and a talking watch. And it all comes with instructions in how to use it, right? Correct, yes, uh -huh. with the lesson plans, yeah. Okay, so we got the side box, we talked about the magic bench. Now let's talk for, for you know, in the last two minutes about some of the key aspects of collaboration, working with opposites, some of the key insights. John, what would you say are some of the key insights from working with opposites and through opposites? What can we take from that? Got to be well, we quick. Need, yeah, we need, we need more inclusion, we need more reverse inclusion, we need more listening to the voices of young people with disabilities, what we'd love to see and the key things we'd like to take out of it. We brought children over from Indonesia uh, with our friends at All Saints School in Anfield, uh, sorry, Sierra Leone, and mm -hmm. we brought children over from Indonesia who returned as leaders in the field themselves. We need lots of more collaborations around the world, and that site box is the medium to generate those collaborations. Physically, children come into St. Vincent's from around the world going out as those peer tutors, but also reverse inclusion in teaching and learning online, remote means, keeping your carbon footprint slow, remote means of teaching and learning around the world. Mm. And that's where the key thing, the surround curriculum to the site box is quite unique. And uh, we need to encourage teachers like Dave Swanston that's done incredible work there. Yes, we, we do. Yes, so we do. We, I, yeah, we I, need, I, yeah, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give Ian a final word as well because we're almost out of time. What's your final word, Ian? You want to share? Yeah, I would like this cons these concepts to be shared around the world and to enable co-creation to undertake an endless evolution. Yes. Thank you so much, all of you to Liverpool. We give you a warm wave across the pond, so to speak. Um, great for you to join us tonight. Have a good night. Thank you so much for watching Reverse Inclusion. That really does take inclusion up a notch and even takes what we've just learned a step further. I do encourage everyone to look through that and try it out because once you've seen the cartoons and the musical, you see what an amazing, brilliant job it actually does and can achieve. You have a wonderful evening. Go to St. Vincent's website. You can check this out more if you're interested in learning more about that. And uh, we'll see you next week. Have a good night.